hosted by the Ireland India Institute at Dublin City University. My name is Jivanta Shetley, and as director of the Institute, I'm delighted to introduce you to our session today. Many of us here um, will have read about or watched the scenes of peaceful and violent protests in India. Thousands continued to assemble in the capital, New Delhi, and to position themselves in a direct challenge to the government. Farmers have been in the capital since November last year to demonstrate against the enactment of three farm laws, which have since been suspended. While the government has offered belated talks, the farmers' organizations want the laws to be repealed, leaving the situation at a tense impasse. Now, today we will be looking at India and Europe, and of course, they are very different entities. Nevertheless, there are interesting insights to be gained from looking at them in parallel. The EU is a mega player in the global agri-food business, and the common agricultural policy is the single largest area of expenditure in the EU budget. It would appear as if nothing could get better, and yet there are numerous calls for reform of the CAP, and we are extremely indebted to have uh, Professor Alan Matthews, who is one of the most renowned experts on this with us. In fact, in 2019, farmers were demonstrating across uh, European capitals, including Dublin, over the incomes, undermining of rural economies, and general criticism of the EU's agricultural practices. In our interaction today, amongst the speakers in the audience, we hope to draw out the parallels, to explore the ways in which similar policy challenges and the dilemma of balancing equity and efficiency play out in different contexts. And so we are very grateful to the speakers and the audience who are kindly using precious time to participate in what is a highly topical and timely discussion. Allow me briefly then to introduce them to you. From India, Professor Sudhana Rayanan, who was until very recently uh, Associate Professor at the Indra Institute of Development Research. And as I've just heard, we didn't make a complete mistake on the poster. She has just moved temporarily for two years to the South Asia Regional Office of the International Food Policy Research Institute. Her long list of publications covers many of India's agrarian issues, including food security, loan waivers, the subsidy syndrome, which was the title of a book she published together with fellow economist Ashok Gulati. Most recently, she has written on the government of India's response to the disruption of agri-food supply chains triggered by the country's lockdown in response to the pandemic in March 2020. And of course, she covers recent developments. Professor Alan Matthews is Professor Emeritus of Agricultural Policy, European Agricultural Policy, in the Department of Trinity, in the Department of Economics, excuse me, at Trinity College, Dublin. Alongside and in addition to an illustrious academic career, Professor Matthews is widely regarded, if I may use the word, as an influencer when it comes to debates on the European Union's com common agricultural policy. In fact, the news outlet Politico EU recently highlighted him as one of five change makers pushing the reform agenda. He was the only academic on that list, and it was pointed out that he is followed by environmentalists and EU officials alike. And so thank you once again to our two external speakers for being with us today. Just a few more words from me on the format of today's session. Professor Sudhan Narayanan and Professor Alan Matthews will be invited to make opening comments, highlighting aspects of agricultural reform in about 10 to 15 minutes each. I would then like to invite Professor Eileen Connolly and Professor Subrata Mitra to give a short response. Professor Eileen Connolly is my direct predecessor as director of the Ireland India Institute, and she has been the driving force behind the Institute. She's a longtime professor at the School of Law and Government at uh, DCU and has led a number of research projects for the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs Official Development Agency, Irish Aid. She also won a major EU grant to set up a European training network, which is called Global India and is still uh, functioning. And we have a number of those fellows with us today. Professor Subrato Mitra is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Heidelberg University in Germany and is an adjunct professor with us at DCU. His numerous books on Indian politics have shaped and influenced a generation of scholars, and we are very thankful to have him with us for a discussion in which we look for insights into understanding the rationality behind the protesters' actions and the government position and for the parallel with Europe. One last organizational announcement from me, and then we can really get started. The session is being recorded and will be hosted on the Institute's website after the event. The speakers have kindly agreed to that. 
Um, I would like to invite the audience to send in their questions as we listen to the proceedings. These questions will come to the hosts and we will integrate them in the discussions as we go along. And therefore, I have uh, nothing more to say except that we look forward to having this uh, vibrant discussion this morning in Europe and this afternoon in India. Thank you for listening. And I would like now to invite Professor Sudhana Raiman uh, to make her opening comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to participate in this panel. Uh, I'm looking forward particularly to the comparative perspective and learnings because it's easy to be insular when there is so much to research in your own context and country. So uh, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, I don't know much about uh, EU, but at the same time, to the extent that there are similarities, I try to flag them so that we do have uh, some comparative perspective emerging even as I speak. Uh, the, uh, I'm going to share my screen now uh, because I have a few slides and the laws that I'll talk about are quite long. So uh, just to get the names for you on, on screen. Uh, so I'm going to focus sharply on agricultural marketing reforms because agricultural reforms mean many things. And the recent events uh, focus sharply on marketing reforms. So I'll I'll talk about markets now and then kind of broaden the horizon to include other kinds of issues that are central to farmers' interests currently. Uh, in in uh, India is a federation of states. So in some sense, there is a center and there are the states. And in that sense, I do think there is a, uh, there is a parallel to the EU, which kind of is an organization of states. And interestingly, the constitution of India actually deems agriculture to be a state subject and not just agriculture, but also markets and fairs. So that trade in agriculture, especially the first point of sale between the farmer producer and the first buyer is actually governed by state level legislation. So the state has the freedom to legislate and provide regulation to all agricultural trade within the state. At the same time, the center's role is also relevant and uh, the center's responsibility actually lies in ensuring free commerce within its territories. Uh, with the understanding that those within state are controlled by the state and the center looks at everything else. So in some sense, both the center state has kind of a responsibility for looking at markets overall. And the center's role so far has been mainly uh, in the form of three broad areas. One is called the Essential Commodities Act. As you can see, it's a 1932 act, which had uh, 1955 amendments. So India got independence in 1947. So the Essential Commodities Act predates India's independence. And uh, those acts uh, essentially wanted to control consumer prices uh, because there was a fear that traders used to manipulate prices rampantly to increase consumer prices. So it was a consumerist legislation meant to keep prices that consumers faced under control. So this is very much a central legislation but once the central notifies that a commodity comes well, is controlled under this act, states can also notify the duration. And essentially what this does is to say that it, it imposes controls and restrictions on how much traders can hold or store commodities to prevent hoarding. Uh, it can also force private players to release commodities into the market to uh, cool prices. So this is the ECA and trade policy, of course, being international, the center has the main responsibility for framing export and import policies. And the third big policy, which is quite central to farmers concerns today is the procurement and price policy. It was a feature of uh, the common agriculture policy as well, where you have support prices. And if uh, prices fall below that, the government comes in and buys in all the produce to buoy prices to ensure that farmers get a certain uh, minimum price. So this procurement and price policy is actually a vestige of the green revolution. So in order to promote higher productivity uh, food grains and the, uh, as in the 19, late 1960s, the government instituted a policy where they would procure rice and wheat and they announced pri minimum prices for 23 commodities, but by and large procurement mostly happens and is focused on rice and wheat. So these three policies are the responsibility of the center, but the state level uh, uh, legislations cover most of all other transactions. 
and this is done through a series called uh, series of legislations that are unique to different states called the agriculture produce marketing regulations and we call them because they are governed by committees that are democratically elected or at least supposed to be we call them apmc acts and this is the bone of contention with the current acts now what do the apmcs do essentially it was to ensure that farmers interests were protected again uh, at the time of independence small farmers were at the mercy of money lenders from whom they borrowed and to whom they sold so this interlocking of transactions made them very vulnerable so the the apmc essentially designated a market yard which you needed to uh, license to trade in it and you needed to pay a charge to the government to be able to trade there and the idea was that this would become a space where many buyers and many sellers come but all trade happens under the regulatory umbrella of a state so that dispute resolution and fair prices can be guaranteed and these are the, so a list of commodities is notified a market area is notified and uh, it's regulated so this was the uh, uh, system that has been in place since the 1960s and 70s now over time even though it was intended to protect the farmers over time these there was political capture elections and many apmcs never happened the traders gained extraordinary control uh, and there was a lot of political trader nexus in a way that they kept out competitors they and they control started controlling prices and there was collusion so even in the when india embarked on reforms in the 1990s agriculture was the one that was more problematic and challenging so reforms were quite delayed um, and by reform we mean uh, allowing the entry of private uh, players uh, who could freely enter markets and exit uh, because here was a licensing system where it was controlled by a powerful few but since 2002 i have to say and this is a, a misunderstood uh, area many people think that the apmcs have monopoly that's not the case since 2002 there's been very gradual reform and as i said because agriculture markets operate at the state level it's the state's prerogative to take steps to reform their legislative frameworks and uh, almost uh, uh, anywhere between 12 and 27 states out of the 36 and all have over time actually caught up and uh, reformed their act substantially to allow private market yards contract farming direct purchases by corporate houses uh, having farmers markets in cities and all of these so in reality actually the uh, when you look at the marketing uh, uh, ecosystem it's quite diverse in many states and it's not as if private players are not there currently uh, here are some pictures just to give you a sense of what these regulated markets look like they are large um, premises where lots of farmers come and traders come and auction and producers auctioned off you also have very very small producers like the picture here where just a basket of uh, fruit is brought into the city traders examine they bilaterally negotiate and a price is fixed so that exists too and there are village level markets and uh, large mandis so there's a whole range of markets and i think we need to keep in mind that there's already a very plural architecture or spaces where produce is traded and sold uh, and each of these many of them are regulated but there's also a lot of unregulated trade uh, currently ongoing partly because of reform but also independently of reform very small producers can't always go to the regulated market and sell so this is uh, uh, there is a whole range of markets um now i'm coming to the three acts how do we read these three acts so in uh, june uh, 2020 the government actually the covid crisis was going on and the government thought that this was an opportune moment to actually reframe fundamentally the way in which agriculture markets function and they introduced these three ordinances which very rapidly were, became acts the first one is we we call it because the names are long you can see it in the box here we we call it for short apmc bypass act so essentially saying that states will no longer control all trade in the state they, their uh, control is now restricted just to the physical market yard and anything that's not part of the yard is now called a trade area and that area would come under the center there will be no taxes no licenses and all electronic modes of transaction are allowed so it essentially now brings in two structures one under the state and the rest is now 
free market, so to speak. The other two acts I won't talk about much now, but uh, essentially the Essential Commodities Act, which I explained to you, now the, the those uh, amendments, essentially it says that uh, there's freedom for people to stock as much as they want. And it's now any stocking limits will be imposed only when prices are extraordinarily high. So that's a kind of uh, uh, gives more space for uh, private players. And the Contract Farming Act essentially provides a framework for written agreements. And uh, I won't talk much about it uh, unless there are questions. And these three acts were, need to be read together. And one of the fundamental things is even though there is a lot of conversation on that it's going to benefit the farmers, there is very little that is centered on the farmers in these acts. The fundamental premise is let's work on the supply chain and encourage private players to come in that will improve efficiency and the gains will be shared uh, or passed on to the farmers in the form of better prices for their output. And uh, here are the problems. In very briefly, there's a lot to say about each of these, uh, and I don't have the time. But I, there's a very odd thing about these three acts. Is on the one hand, it's extreme deregulation, where you now have a space that's outside the jurisdiction of the states, where anything, anybody can do anything. Uh, so private players are free to transact. They do not have to report. It's not monitored. And it invisibilizes all transactions. But it also, so in some sense, it really frees markets. This also has very weak dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, for example, the act says that if a trader cheats the farmer, the farmer can go to the subdivisional magistrate locally. And the sub, uh, subdivisional magistrate needs to form a committee where the trader nominates somebody and the farmer nominates somebody. And the most often when the trader cheats the farmers, they disappear. So there's no question of getting back the trader to nominate somebody for dispute resolution. So very basic kind of issues like that are absent. And you have no idea how prices are set. In the Mondays, you used to have auctions. So there is a way in which even if there is collusion, there was a price setting mechanism. And here it's more or less anything goes and it's about relative power of the farmer vis-a-vis -vis the buyer. Uh, on the other hand, so on the one hand, it just frees up everything from government control. But at the same time, there is also a, a, a counter concern, which is centralization. So by resting away from the states, it has centralized the regulation of all of these private trade areas and rest, uh, puts the control in the hands of the central government. And Jean Dres uh, wrote saying that we should call it drama because it's now a dual regulation of agriculture markets because it now creates a central space and a state space. And there is a possibility that as the state space gets eroded and the central space becomes more and more important, the states lose control over the uh, agricultural markets within the state. So there is a very real possibility of over-centralization in these trade areas. And there is a concern that it would come most, mostly from data consolidation of supply chains, logistics, data ownership. And here again, I want to draw the parallel with the EU recommendation by the International Panel for, of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems that had actually been guarding against this kind of data over consolidation of agribusiness firms. And I think that control uh, is actually, even if it doesn't happen immediately, I think this set of regulations allows uh, the possibility of that happening. Now, I've sort of offered a critique. There are obvious merits to these acts because there are a lot of collective farmer producer organizations, new forms of social enterprises that have come up that can benefit greatly uh, where they don't have to go through the traders who have vested interests. And there is still a lot of possibility for positive outcomes of these acts. But at the same time, there is nothing that guarantees these outcomes. And it looks like the negatives of the weaknesses of this act, but also the fundamental principle of centralization is a big cause for concern. Uh, now I'm going to finish up with this last slide. Uh, which is large, but uh, the question is why are farmers protesting? Now you would have uh, seen and heard a lot of commentary saying, uh, A, these farmers are protesting, they don't understand the laws, it's going to benefit them. A second uh, uh, threat is, oh, they are only Punjabi and Haryana farmers, and they are the ones who have been mollycoddled. So when I talked about the procurement and price support policies, they are the Green Revolution leaders. They led India's quest for food self-sufficiency. And the system is, uh, was put in place and they benefited a lot from it. And today there's a sense that now they've become dependent on it. 
and i and there is an accusation that you know that's what they are fighting against uh, and uh, so we should ignore them or it it doesn't have merit because uh, it's just uh, vested interests of another kind uh, now i've put up this slide because uh, while it's true that these three acts have triggered the protests these three acts cannot be seen in isolation so this is market reform but there's a larger question of agriculture reform and the farmers main fear is on the one hand you need complementary reforms that are state supported and they don't know where that investment is going to come from if the government is relying fully on private players they worry about federalism because state governments are far more receptive and they have more political power vis a vis state governments than with the center they worry about regulatory fragmentation they don't know who's in charge and the state role in agri food markets they fear that the whole uh, support system that is in place will eventually collapse and the apmcs themselves will disappear leaving them at the mercy of private players especially the large agri businesses that are seeking to consolidate and in this context there are a lot of other challenges that india faces now about how best to support farmers now one must remember that the average size holding of indian farmers is around 1.16 hectares and going down not up and uh, there are so many people even though it's only 14% of the gdp is, comes from agriculture almost 50% of it depend on agriculture for sources of livelihood and these are all huge concerns so i leave it at that to say that uh, the protests that farmers uh, uh, the, the farmer protests that we see today uh, began with a as a response to the three acts but in essence we are reacting to a whole lot of set of concerns on all kinds of issues uh, around the relationship between the state and the farmers and the state's future role in agriculture I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sudhanarayan, for giving us a wonderful overview and compressing all that uh, into exactly 15 minutes. I'll hand over directly to Professor Alan Matthews to continue our session. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning uh, and good afternoon to, to everybody. Let me uh, just uh, make a small comment uh, at the outset. One of the drawbacks of um, attending uh, from home is that my neighbor above me uh, has decided this morning to repair his bathroom. So I'm just hoping uh, there is occasionally the sound of drilling in the background. Uh, Jivanta, if it disturbs, uh, I can hold off, but uh, at least now it, 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 is, uh, it is stopped. But let's hope that I can uh, make my contribution without too much background noise. Secondly, um, can I just thank uh, Professor Nar uh, uh, Narayanan for, his, for her um, uh, wonderful uh, uh, account. I must admit, I know very little uh, about the Indian situation, so I'm going to focus entirely on the uh, European uh, situation and hopefully our discussions and, and the, uh, the questions later will be able to, uh, to uh, draw the parallels. I do have a couple of um, slides just to talk to, so if I may just take a moment to uh, uh, share my screen. Uh, does that look okay to you? Yeah. Uh, so, um, I'm going to, if you like, take up from the very uh, final comments um, uh, made with respect to, if you like, some differences between um, Indian agriculture, European agriculture, uh, but maybe also some similarities. So um, Europe also has been um, going through this uh, agricultural transition, although much further along the road than India has. Um, if we simply use the indicator of the share of um, the, the labor force in agriculture, we see that it is steadily declining uh, over time. It's a relatively short uh, time period here, just from 2002, but it's difficult to get uh, uh, statistics for the European Union of 28 countries going back uh, longer, but you can certainly see uh, the trend, um, not only in relative terms, but also in absolute terms. So uh, uh, farm numbers uh, in 2005, uh, we had over 14 million uh, farm holdings in the European Union. Um, by 2016, in other words, within a decade, uh, that number had fallen to, to 10 million. Uh, so uh, there is considerable uh, 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 structural adjustment uh, taking place. 
Um, if we look at uh, another aspect of this adjustment is the, is the, the growing concentration of farm land. So uh, the green bars here are the proportion of uh, farm holdings uh, in the different size groups. So you can see the size groups along the, uh, the horizontal axis there. So, uh, you know, in the very small um, uh, size groups, so less than five hectares, uh, we have almost two thirds of all European farms, whereas in the uh, very largest size group, um, and I, I'm going to have to try to uh, um, just uh, yep, get rid of the, the pictures on my screen there. Uh, the very so over a hundred hectares, um, uh, we have only um, three percent of uh, of um, of holdings, and yet uh, that three percent accounts for over half of of farm land. So that's the orange. Uh, bar. So, uh, of course, this differs from member state to member state. Um, uh, for historical reasons, uh, this skewness in the distribution of uh, land uh, would be larger in, in some of the newer member states, uh, where, uh, for historical reasons, going back to the uh, time of the centrally planned uh, economies, you, you had very large collective farms which uh, were transferred uh, or transformed into uh, into sort of companies in 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 the in the market economy sense, um, but nonetheless it, it it gives some indication of. Uh, the structure of, of land ownership. And that, of course, is also important when we come to look at uh, who actually benefits from uh, farm support. Um, this particular slide is, uh, uh, you can interpret it in two ways. It's first of all, a comparison uh, of um, the earnings in agriculture. Uh, so expressed as the uh, return to uh, family workers. So if you if you sort of um, uh, calculate on a on a per unit basis, so so uh, averaging out part time and and, and full time farmer workers um, or family workers on farms, um, and look at the uh, the family income of those workers, and then compare that to the um, uh, average wage in the rest of the economy. So you, you can see that um, uh, the percentages initially were, were quite low, about a third, um, uh, and they have risen somewhat over time, uh, perhaps up to almost a half uh, in the most uh, recent period. Um, this, of course, reflects not only uh, the relative income, but also the relative uh, productivity uh, uh, in, in the uh, agricultural sector relative to the, to the non-farm sector. And um, uh, I would argue that so long as we have this productivity gap, if you like, between the two sectors, we will continue to see uh, the um, outflow of labor uh, from the agricultural sector and uh, uh, the reduction in the number of farms. Uh, now to turn to the, to the policy uh, angle. Um, and the way we, we measure policy is to look at the overall transfers uh, to farmers uh, from both consumers and from uh, producers, uh, from taxpayers. So uh, from consumers, so consumers transfer to, to farmers where they are paying, if you like, above the, uh, the world market price. So this could be due to tariff protection at the border, um, or it could be due to uh, administrative uh, prices uh, within uh, the, the European Union. Uh, and the taxpayer, of course, can, can uh, provide support through uh, direct payments um, uh, uh, transferred uh, directly uh, to farmers. So uh, we have here um, the series going back to 1986 uh, when, when these statistics were first collected. Um, and you can see that in, in nominal terms, um, and, and the axis here is on the left-hand side, uh, so we can see that support has remained fairly steady over this period. Um, so in other words, it varied a, a little bit, and that reflects variations in, in, in world market prices more than in the, uh, the taxpayer uh, uh, transfers. Um, it, it has varied between, say, uh, 80 uh, billion uh, to 100 uh, billion euro. Of course, agricultural output uh, has grown over that time. Uh, so if we express that support as a percentage of the uh, total farm receipts, so if, if you like the total revenue of farmers, 
um, you get a somewhat different picture in the early, uh, um, in, in the late 80s, uh, it was around 40% uh, of the total, uh, but today it has fallen to about 20% of the total. So relative to, if you like, what, what farmers are, are earning in, in total from both the marketplace and from these, uh, from these transfers, uh, the share has roughly halved. But I, I think the most significant change uh, is this third uh, graph. Uh, so this basically shows the share of that support, which is coming in the form of uh, support linked to output. Uh, so uh, it could be market price support, where they, the price that the farmer gets is, is somehow supported by, uh, by government uh, intervention, or it could be um, payments which are directly linked, or what we say in, 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 in technical terms, that are coupled to what the farmer produces. So that if you, if you produce a ton of wheat, uh, you get a, a payment that is specifically linked uh, to that uh, ton of wheat. And you can see that in the early part of the period, the late 80s, um, uh, so we're looking now at the axis is on the, the right-hand side, um, you can see that almost 90%, over 90% of the total support uh, that uh, farmers received in Europe at that period uh, were, was actually uh, coming through the marketplace. So this was the, the time when the European Union was widely known as, as Fortress Europe. It had a, a, a very regulated uh, market situation um, where uh, intervention prices, as we call them, the, the minimum support prices for farmers were very high. Uh, they were uh, at that time perhaps double and, and indeed for some commodities like sugar, even three or four times the world market price. So, uh, and that was protected, if you like, against uh, imports, cheaper imports from outside Europe by very high uh, tariff uh, barriers. And of course, as Europe moved to, uh, uh, to, to more than self-sufficiency and started to produce uh, surpluses of agricultural produce, uh, we, we simply dumped uh, those surpluses on world markets uh, with the aid of, of export subsidies. That had um, uh, uh, clearly a number of um, negative consequences. First of all, it was very expensive for the European taxpayer. And secondly, of course, it created huge tensions uh, with our trading partners who, uh, for, for obvious reasons, uh, objected uh, to uh, this subsidized uh, competition. So what we see then in that black line is the progress of reform of this agricultural policy over uh, the last 25 years or so. Um, and those of us in Ireland will, will, will be well aware that that reform process was started in 1992 by uh, the then Irish uh, Commissioner for Agriculture, Ray McSharry. Uh, so we often refer to this as, as the McSharry reforms. And basically those reforms took the form of substituting um, that uh, support through uh, higher market prices by uh, direct payments to farmers. So the, 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 the intervention prices, those minimum support prices were gradually lowered, uh, but uh, farmers were compensated by increases in direct payments uh, to, uh, to them. And you can see that in the blue line that you know, the, the, the overall level of support actually hasn't changed uh, very much. Initially, uh, those direct payments were actually coupled to production. So farmers had to produce um, uh, in order to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to acquire those uh, payments. But then in, in the um, early 2000s, uh, what we call the Fischler reform after the Austrian commissioner for agriculture at the time, Franz Fischler, uh, those direct uh, payments, uh, those coupled direct payments, were converted into decoupled payments. So basically, these are now uh, per hectare payments that farmers get. Uh, and it doesn't matter what they produce, which commodity, and indeed, uh, in theory, um, provided you, you keep your land in, 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 in agriculture, good agricultural condition, you don't actually have to produce anything in order to receive uh, those, uh, those payments. Um, so that is uh, the, the history, if you like, of, of uh, uh, policy reform in the European Union. Of course, uh, the challenges that uh, we face in Europe now, uh, and indeed in other parts of the world, including India, I'm sure, 
um, is the challenge of sustainability. So we're increasingly aware that uh, agricultural production as it is, has intensified. Yes, it has provided us with um, uh, safe and, 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 and nutritious and, and cheap food, but it has done so at the cost of uh, uh, damage, uh, great damage to the environment, both in terms of the loss of biodiversity, in terms of the leakage of nutrients, uh, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus uh, into waterways and into the air, uh, in terms of climate gases, uh, in terms of soil degradation, uh, water use, and so on. So the current uh, uh, path of reform in the, uh, for agricultural policy in the European Union is to try to, to target these payments uh, less on the income support objective and more on the green transition. In other words, trying to incentivize and to support farmers in moving away from these more exploitative forms of agricultural practice, uh, which are damaging to nature, damaging to the environment, uh, and to try to encourage uh, a move towards more sustainable uh, farm, uh, farm practices. So uh, my final slide then, uh, Devanta, just to sort of try to summarize, um, I would see that this process of agricultural adjustment, which, which you know, many people regret, they, they regret the disappearance of small farms. They see that as an important element in the uh, viability of, of, of rural areas, uh, both in, in, in social and in economic terms. But as long as we have this gap uh, in labor productivity, young people will simply find it more attractive to take up uh, uh, jobs outside the farm uh, and uh, structural adjustment and, and concentration of land will continue to I showed you, uh, where just 3% of the, the holdings, that's about 300,000 farms, actually have half of the land and indeed get half of the support. Um, uh, a lot of that support is also capitalized into land prices, so it pushes land prices up and you know that makes it more difficult for younger people to, to, to enter the, the industry. Of course, to have a smooth adjustment process, if people are, are moving out of agriculture, they, they need to have alternative employment opportunities uh, in the non-farm sector. And of course, as far as possible, uh, it would be desirable to, to have those jobs in rural areas so that uh, we do keep the, 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 the viability and the, the, the regional uh, distribution of our uh, populations. Um, I would also stress the importance of uh, you know, education and, and, and skills, uh, particularly to the younger generation, so that they do have the possibility of competing for uh, those uh, non-farm jobs on a level uh, playing field. And just to pick up a point, um, uh, uh, which uh, uh, Professor uh, Narnan uh, uh, made in terms of the, uh, the debate in India between centralization at the federal level and, 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 and the, uh, the powers and responsibilities uh, uh, at the state level. Europe uh, also uh, has that tension and it might be something to uh, reflect on in the, uh, in, in the, in the debate to come. Um, so the current uh, reform of the CAP uh, not only is trying to move support uh, in, into a more uh, environmentally uh, friendly uh, uh, mode, but it is also recognized that trying to manage everything at the, at the central level. So the, the, the Europe's common agricultural policy has been highly centralized. Um, and we have found that that hasn't been very satisfactory. So having if you like, one set of rules uh, applying, you know, from the north of Finland to the south of Spain and from the west of Ireland uh, to uh, uh, the Black Sea uh, coast simply doesn't make sense. So another of the objectives of the current reform is actually to return greater responsibility, greater subsidiarity, if you like, uh, to the member states so that they can design the policy in a way which 
actually uh, meets their needs uh, more 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 accurately than than a, a uniform policy uh, across the European Union as a whole. So uh, let me uh, stop at that point, and uh, I'm looking forward very much to uh, what the discussants uh, have to say and to the to the questions afterwards. Thanks, Jivanta. Thank you so much, Professor Alan Matthews, um, again for uh, highlighting and pinpointing aspects that we can take up in the discussion, especially the center state dimension, which I think is, is a fascinating parallel, and for giving us this potted overview, which is extremely useful. I'd like to now invite Professor Eileen Connolly to make some remarks and give a response, and then directly over to Professor Subhata Mitra. So first, Eileen, please. Uh, just unmuting myself. Um, uh, thank you both. That was really interesting. And as someone who is by no means particularly knowledgeable about agriculture, that was very, very clear. And I suppose a couple of issues I'd like to raise, and I think they both apply to Europe, maybe more in the past and India in the present, is the focus of agricultural policy in Europe was very much on production. Um, in India, I think we're seeing the marketization of farming, which again is about production. It's about increasing food production in India, so about increasing the Indian economy, but it's not really taking into account the needs of farmers across all the different states. The farm protests seem to me to be coming at the end of a long line of protests we've seen for years now. Um, uh, suicides levels, very high suicide levels um, among Indian farmers. And these policies, while they address sort of macro level needs, don't seem to be dealing with the needs of farmers on the ground. And the reason I'm linking this to EU policy, because one of the things EU policy did was, yes, it supported small farmers in many ways, but the biggest beneficiaries were large farmers and commercial producers. And many of the problems of CAP were driven by the way in which those policies supported those very large farmers supported the commercialization, large-scale commercialization of farming. And I think the marketization, both of European agriculture and of Indian agriculture, are part of a larger way of thinking about the economy and thinking about how we produce and I think at essence, um, the Indian government is not being much worse in this than other governments, but it's still failing to, I suppose, address core needs for future sustainability, both for people's lives and for environmental protection of the planet. Though I would also say that in Europe, we need far more emphasis on environmental protection of the planet um, because we are far worse polluters. And that's my big question I want to raise. Yes, these farm reforms in some ways make sense. They have weaknesses, but at their core, don't both sets of reforms ignore um, vital communal interests in, in the EU and in India? I'm going to stop there, Jiva. Thanks so much, Eileen. So I've noted down uh, some points which I can uh, bring up again when we open for the responses from the speakers. But before that, I hand over to Professor Subrata. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Shirtley, for this uh, invitation. I've learned a lot from the two papers you have heard from professors Narayanan and uh, Professor Alan Matthew. A uh, remarkable thing is the convergence between the Indian situation and the European situation, Alan. Thank you for making those points. Um, what I want to do is to make three 
comments and uh, ask a question to both panelists. I'm a politics man, so let me go straight into the politics of what is happening, or rather not happening. Why is this controversy there? Um, and why are global celebrities jumping in? Um, why is there so much misinformation about what is happening in India? Now look, the Indian constitution expected agriculture, in their own form of subsidiarity to be uh, to be uh, managed by regional and local governments. That was the division of power. The Indian constitution expected India to be an electoral democracy based on party competition. So what has gone wrong? What has gone wrong is in a democracy, political parties compete on the basis of rules that they cooperate on. So that substantial trust where two parties competing come up with two different lines and they expect the population to vote is not happening. Why isn't it happening? Look at the states which are at the forefront of this opposition. These are Maharashtra, Punjab and Delhi, states which are ruled by parties opposed to the union government. Similarly, in the Indian parliament, there's a terrific asymmetry now in terms of the strength of the opposition and strength of the party ruling coalition. So the opposition you see to a policy in the heart of hearts, most people would agree that Indian agriculture badly needs reform. However, they have to oppose for reasons which are political. So as a political scientist, I would look at the Indian political system and process to ask, why is this controversy there? As I have explained, the problem lies at the level of uh, the lack of trust between the two sides and the alacrity with which the opposition is jumping into the protest is to show that they are doing politics with economics, which is what you expect politicians to do. Now, many of you have seen how the great, greater environmental activists have jumped in to criticize the government of India for undertaking these uh, reform laws. Well, we have heard today why reform is necessary to protect the environment, how the subsidy dependency has produced a kind of agriculture which is creating in Punjab waterlogging and making a lot of land unusable. The kind of subsidy-based uh, protection is creating in India reserves three times of what is needed and a lot of that food actually rots or are eaten by mice. So these reforms are necessary at least for the reasons of environment, but environmental activists don't take this information into account. Why is that? To that, my answer would be, go no further than the Pavlov's dog. This is a condition reflex. The moment you see farmers protesting, you're no longer asking why are they protesting? You're thinking of the time when Europe was going through a similar process and Barrington Moore described it as, at least in Scotland, sheep ate men that the state was an executive committee of the whole bourgeoisie and capitalist farming was decimating agriculture, agriculturists. But that is not the case in India. The state is not one block. The state is also the Supreme Court. The state is also media. The state is a lot of other centers of power, which is why there is a lot of scope for dialogue, but that is not being taken up again for reasons which are political. So my hope is conversations like this will trickle down and show people why politics and economics should work together and not at loggerheads. So I come to my question and I'll end with that. Now, both our speakers have shown why reform is difficult. That in 1992, when the government of India came up with the policy of liberalization of import-export 
licensing and so on. It was done as what is called governance by stealth, reform by stealth. And Sudha, thank you very much for pointing out that probably the current government was trying to redo the 1992 for Indian agriculture by taking advantage of the COVID crisis. That probably is the reason why it didn't quite go down as well as the 1992 reforms had gone down, which is why I'll turn towards Alan and ask, even Europe has failed to undertake the reform of its agricultural policy, among other things, which led to the breakup of the European Union. So even for mature democracies, reform is a difficult business. So Sudha, what is the way forward? What should India do to make this economically necessary thing also politically feasible? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mitra, for showcasing some of the uh, complicated, uh, tricky political side to this discussion. Um, we are very lucky to have two economists with us and two open-minded economists um, who will uh, hopefully take up now this discussion, I think, which both you and Professor Eileen uh, um, pinpointed, that of the, the difficulty of reforms in any context. How do you bring about long-lasting and I think I also mentioned it in my introduction, how do you balance equity and efficiency? Um, how do we bring back the moral economy um, when we are talking about liberalization, commercialization, commodification? Um, and I think you know, these are as much 21st century problems as they were in previous centuries. So I'd be very glad now to open the discussion. Perhaps we could begin with Professor Sudha. Um, to take up any of the points that uh, were raised and otherwise I'll bring in some more if they are not touched upon by you and also a couple of questions that have been coming through the chat function. Thank you very much, Professor Sudha. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professors Corneli and Mitra for your comments. I'll start with the, uh, the, the Professor Mitra's uh, question on what is the way forward. Uh, uh, I think many of us are asking ourselves uh, one comment that has been repeated very often, both by politicians and economists and commentators, is that these reforms were long overdue and uh, they have happened. And those who, yeah. also, among those who actually were proponents of the reform, they themselves have made a U turn and are now objecting to reform. Yeah. And I think uh, it, one part of it is true. We've been discussing agriculture ma market reform for about 20 years now. And there have been eight committees or nine committees that have all said the same thing. And in fact, uh, my former co-author, uh, Professor Ashok Gulati, refused to be on another committee that would say the same thing. He said, there are so many pages, you go implement them. There, there, there's no point in repeating the same thing. At the same time, this reform was different because uh, this the particular uh, uh, elements of the, the new reform weren't discussed at all. And so in some sense, it undermines uh, uh, the states which typically legislated uh, on this. So one is the acts themselves weren't discussed. I think that's an issue. And related to that is we need to ask whether this is the reform we need. And I, there I would kind of say that without this act, we were doing very well anyway. Uh, I'm a kind of believer in gradualism. I don't think uh, things like this should happen too fast. There are vested interests, there are uh, issues, and there is a lot that we don't know. On paper, something looks good when you implement it, there's a backlash, there are things that are in a blind spot we didn't notice. And I think the path of gradualism that different states have followed have not worked badly. So for example, Karnataka has an integrated electronic market where anyone can bid from anywhere. They broke the trader nexus, issued unified licenses, uh, several states like Maharashtra allow private uh, market yards and there have been a lot of gains by different states at different paces. It's another matter that it was going too slowly, but I think huge gains have been made and in fact, if you look at the agriculture startup culture, in one in nine ag active startups actually are established in India. So it's not as if reform was not happening or private players were not coming in. Uh, so in that sense, I feel this, uh, this particular way in which this act is structured is actually maybe may a step backward because 
all the lessons that were learned by different states in different contexts, those lessons, we didn't draw on those lessons, we didn't draw on those experiences. And it's as if you're going in one direction and you just decide to go in another direction. So many states that have actually been at the forefront of reform are left wondering what of their reforms now. Is it, now it's all, the game has just changed. So in that sense, uh, I, I believe uh, retreating a bit and allowing states to come up with what they have learned, yeah. what worked and what didn't, would actually be a very useful engagement. Uh, so I'm in some sense favor of halting on the uh, act for now. Uh, on the question uh, that Professor Connolly was raising, uh, I think uh, as uh, Professor Mitra was saying, uh, the Green Revolution has cast a long shadow in terms of environmental consequences. And I think part of the imagination of the current policymakers is that allowing private players to come in will actually change that. They will diversify and uh, adopt better practices that are more sustainable. So in some sense, there is that intent that we should uh, actually have sustainability as a goal, but we will achieve that not through incentivizing diversification, but private players will offer the incentives to get away from this uh, unsustainable practices. Uh, and uh, whether or not that's the right way to go is a different question. Uh, but I, I do agree with Professor Conley in that 51% uh, uh, of Indian agriculture is rain fed and smallholders are actually too small to make it work, uh, agribusinesses won't find it lucrative or remunerative to work with such smallholders. They tend to go and work with uh, farmers who have locational advantages, irrigation, and large farmers. So I think that is the, there you're right in that it's not uh, farmer focused. It's more of trying to make the sector more vibrant and increase incomes where the government uh, itself has failed in the sense that the structural path that Indian economy has grown in has not created enough jobs. Like Professor Matthews was saying, our, uh, we have precarious jobs and people are not leaving the farm, selling their land and going to the city because the jobs are so precarious, they yeah. still retain ties to the land. So that failure is something that uh, the Indian government is struggling to deal with. And one way in which they uh, see a way out is to say, let's focus on farm incomes, get in private players, they put in the capital, they increase the earnings. And so you make agriculture lucrative because the structural transformation is somewhat skewed. Uh, so that's the logic. And yes, it does miss out people in large tracts of land where they don't have those advantages and they would never be able to participate in markets. So there I agree with uh, Professor Connolly in that the focus of the government is somewhat very narrow and uh, uh, probably won't work for most of the smallholders in India. Yeah, I'll stop there. Sorry if I took more time than uh, I Thanks should so have. Much. Yeah. Professor Allen, would, would you like to come in at that point? And well, uh, that, that, that was a, an, an excellent review. Simply, uh, maybe just to... I mean, both of the discussions raised this fascinating question of, you know, how does reform take place and, and what, what, uh, what makes for a successful uh, reform? And I suppose just trying to draw the lessons from the European experience, um, there's no doubt that um, uh, in the early stages, our reforms were largely pushed uh, by external uh, forces. So in a sense, you can say that the reforms were, were we, we were dragged kicking and screaming into uh, the, 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 the new situation. So it was either the budget uh, constraint, I mean, the, 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 simply the, the coppers were, were dry, if you like, to continue the, uh, the pre-existing policy, a change had to, to, to come from that perspective. Or, as I indicated, uh, it came because of pressure from international uh, trading partners, um, uh, particularly uh, around the uh, negotiations of the agricultural agreement in the WTO uh, in the uh, late 80s and, and, and early uh, 1990s. What's interesting, I think, about the reform process now, and I referred to the um, attempt to uh, raise the, the level of environmental and climate ambition in terms of agricultural uh, policy in, in Europe. There aren't really, I mean, of course, there are external constraints. We, 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 we have become increasingly aware of the, uh, the urgency of, of the, the need to, to, to make this green transition and, and to, uh, to, to, to 
bring our, our, our farming back more into uh, harmony with uh, planetary boundaries and, 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 and with nature and, and our environment uh, generally. Um, so you could say that there are these external constraints, but I think what's, what's interesting about uh, the current state of, 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 of reform in Europe is that the, uh, the, uh, the, the number of, of uh, actors engaged in agricultural policy has expanded uh, quite dramatically. So I would have seen, uh, when I would have started teaching agricultural policy uh, at university, um, agricultural policy making was quite a closed um, environment. Uh, you had the, the, uh, the ministries of agriculture, you had the farm groups uh, making demands, and it was a very technical subject. Not many people outside the industry really understood it. Um, uh, so it was very much a question of, of, of a, a small group of insiders trying to uh, move the policy through these external constraints. I think that has now changed quite dramatically. We, we, we have uh, clearly environmental uh, groups. Uh, we have public health groups uh, because of the links between uh, diet and, and, and health. Uh, we have climate activists, uh, all now uh, focusing on, on agricultural policy. So the, not only has the agenda widened, but the, the number of actors has widened. And I think that does create scope for a reform, which perhaps didn't exist uh, in, in the past. And maybe that also addresses Eileen's point that you know reform up to now hasn't really addressed that public interest, uh, whereas I think we do see that now being much more emphasized. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I could at this point bring in a couple of questions that have come through. I have uh, one question for Professor Sutha and one for Professor Allen, and they both touch upon and continue this point about reforms, but from slightly different angles. Um, for Professor Sudha, this is from Tomas in uh, Warsaw. Um, is it possible for India to create a fair trade system for agricultural markets, taking into account the brokerage culture that exists? Um, unfortunately, we can't draw in the person who's put that question to elaborate, but I, I hope the, the meaning is broadly conveyed. So without the reforms, um, how do you get past some of the institutionalized practices that are both cultural um, and um, institutionalized in other ways? To Professor Allen, um, a different question, uh, slightly uh, broadening the topic again on the EU, bringing in Brexit. Um, and this is from Surhit Patel, who is um, joining us from India. Um, he'd like to hear your views on how the UK bringing in their version of agricultural reforms might be more dynamic, in fact, now that they've gotten out of the EU um, and what that might mean for how the EU goes about it. And I think there's a specifically green angle to that. So maybe, um, Professor Sudha, you could come in there and uh, follow up with more questions. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, the Indian farmer faces this perennial problem that because of the scale of operation, they need to aggregate before it makes it economical or uh, remunerative for the supply chain actors to work with them. And that's happened through a lot of intermediaries. And the new uh, uh, thinking is that we should disintermediate the channel and uh, have efficiency gains that are passed on to the farmers. But one of the interesting things we have noticed is even when modern private players come in, they too disintermediate to start with, but eventually uh, intermediate. And I'll explain with an example. Farmer producer organizations are often seen as a way in which uh, different producers aggregate, weed out the middlemen who take a brokerage and deal directly with consumers. And there are farmers markets as well. But what we are increasingly seeing is that the supply chain elongates eventually because even the farmer uh, producer organizations are often co-opted by retailers. So you don't have really uh, the vision that we'll have a broker free uh, fair price being transmitted to the farmer. We've not seen many successful examples of that, except in where farmer producers organizations and cooperatives have uh, worked successfully. But those have also been very challenging. We don't see many viable enterprises that are located in farmer, uh, with farmer groups. And I think that's very much a priority of the current government. They have a policy for nurturing 10,000 FPOs, farmer producer organizations and funding them so that they can uh, go this direction. I think anything that's more formal in terms of a certification, I think it's very hard because of the immense diversity of uh, actors, crops, and cultures. 
uh, and I think everyone sort of uh, there is a kind of consensus that aggregation of farmer interests is the best way to ensure that uh, the benefits go directly to the farmers without uh, intermediaries. But I think the uh, we we don't know enough about uh, different experiments. We'll have to wait and see. And I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Professor Anna. Well, it, it, the Brexit question is really an interesting one. Um, it, I suppose, has uh, two potential ramifications for uh, reform uh, within the EU. Uh, the most obvious one uh, is that um, the United Kingdom was, of course, a major uh, net contributor uh, to the EU budget. So its departure uh, meant less money and it created, uh, as we saw, uh, considerable difficulties in, in reaching agreement on the overall EU budget and, and as part of that, the, the budget for, for the agricultural policy. I mean, that has now been resolved um, and uh, actually funding uh, for agriculture has been you know, more or less maintained over the coming period, at, uh, at least in nominal terms. Um, so I think the second uh, impact which the question uh, refers to is the the fact that the UK intends uh, to to embark on a on a, I won't say a, a radically different uh, approach, but certainly uh, to move more quickly uh, towards this um, uh, retargeting of direct payments um, uh, away from sort of income support, where as as Eileen and, and, and I agree, most of that actually ends up in the hands of bigger farms and bigger farm holdings that aren't necessarily uh, the ones that you would see as, as being in need of income support um, uh, and intends to redirect that support towards what they call uh, public goods. So uh, these would be, these could be uh, mostly environmental uh, public goods, um, uh, but it could also be things like animal, higher animal welfare standards and so on. Um, now, when um, Michael Gove uh, was the was in charge of agriculture, he put forward a very ambitious uh, time span uh, for this. So basically, the the, the direct payments uh, uh, would would be phased out over a, a, a really quite a short period of time, five years or so, um, and then this new uh, payment scheme whereby uh, farmers would, would 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 get support, but they would have to uh, indicate that they were providing, if you like, uh, these public goods that were of of, of general uh, interest and, and benefit to the rest of society in order to to, to get that support. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm my, the latest I, I, I sort of um, hear from, from, from the United Kingdom is that uh, perhaps that will not uh, be rolled out uh, quite as quickly as uh, originally intended. And, you know, it is clear that we need to understand the constraints. And, and uh, in, in one of the charts I showed, um, I indicated that the uh, share of farmers' total revenue um, coming from support was around 20% uh, on average across the, the, the EU. If we express that support as a share of farmers' income, in other words, how dependent are farmers uh, on this support for their income? On average, it's, it's about 40%, and that would also apply in the United Kingdom. But of course, for certain sectors, particularly some of the, 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 the livestock sectors, that that actually can actually reach up to 100%. So in terms of farm income, those payments are really critical. Um, and of course, farmers worry that uh, in any major uh, transformation of, of, of the system that um, you know, they will lose out, that, that they will not be able to, uh, to, to, they may not find themselves eligible or not be able to participate in the new scheme that is, uh, is, is, is going to, 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 to replace. So you, know, you can see why there might be some uh, delays in, in rolling out the, the, the UK scheme, but it's certainly what we as economists would, would, would call, it's going to be a very interesting natural experiment. Uh, so you know, the EU will now have a comparator, will have a, 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 a country that, you know, at least in principle or in rhetoric is saying that it wants to, uh, to, to, to have a much more ambitious reform of its policy than uh, we have been prepared to, um, uh, to contemplate uh, in the European Union to date. And of course, to see how that will work out both, in, both for farmers, but also for the environment and for the public as a whole. 
Thank you very much. Um, just to bring in, I mean, they, they might uh, be a bit diversified, the questions, but just to bring in a couple more from the audience. Um, there is um, one that's coming through about the, the global angle, which again is important for both India and Europe, and again, differently so. Um, to Professor Sudha, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that skepticism with regards to big corporates coming in and whether there is an international dimension to that as well. So to what extent would you see some of these problems also as part and parcel of the globalization phenomena? Um, and Professor Allen, there's a specific question here uh, from Kirsten um, Apun from the Clean Energy Wire, who wants to know what would you think are going to be the likely effects of the EU farm to fork strategy on trade, specifically if there are going to be these climate um, issues introduced, will that sort of be more tariffs? How is that going to affect trade with the non-EU countries, presumably also EU-India trade eventually, considering that is a negotiation that has been in the works for quite a long time. So just briefly those sort of global angles from both of you, um, if possible. Thank you. Uh, yeah, on uh, I'll just uh, split it into two parts. One is the question of global businesses. And there are agribusinesses already in India, like Cargill, which controls along with uh, key players of almost 80% of the world's grain trade. Uh, and they are present in India. But I think what we are seeing in India is a more recent trend of Indian uh, big businesses. And um, there are kind, there is a perception that a couple of them are particularly close to the current government. And uh, the farmers actually in the protests have targeted these two firms. Uh, and they fear one of them has just entered, entered online uh, grocery detail and data, the space with a collaboration with Facebook, they've entered uh, into the data space and, and have a agricultural app through which they plan to link farmers to markets. The other one is in logistics. So uh, contrary to global fears of global players, I think there is a lot of uh, uh, fears that these uh, Indian big businesses will control the space, also because of their proximity to those in power. Uh, and in fact, uh, some anthropologists and economists make the argument that this uh, local capital, which has been very prominent in the working of ag agricultural markets in India, will soon give way to national capital. Although global capital, we don't believe is going to happen yet. It will only happen indirectly through the uh, investments they make in Indian businesses. I think India by and large has been very protective of uh, agriculture. Uh, it's sort of, de it declined uh, joining the RCEP, which is the regional comprehensive economic partnership in uh, Asia. Uh, for fear of uh, their dairy farmers actually getting hurt. And even in the WTO, it's kind of stood ground on the procurement uh, of food grains, um, despite uh, knowing that uh, we need to do something about it. So in some sense, India has been quite insulated from global uh, forces. Although export promotion is a very prominent part of the government strategies, it's been very hesitant opening up its border to imports or free trade agreements where the, the fear is we won't be competitive. And global capital will be kept out in the interests of Indian large businesses. That's my perception of where we stand today. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Allen. The, the, this uh, debate about the, the relationship between trade and sustainability in the, in the context of agri-food products is, is really interesting and really important and one which is certainly rising up the agenda uh, in Europe. And uh, I think there are two aspects to this. Uh, one is uh, the aspect of um, uh, the impact of imports into Europe. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the, the exporting countries. So the, the, the kind of pressure on supply chains uh, to avoid um, contributing to negative, uh, both environmental impacts. So for example, deforestation uh, through our, our, our imports, um, but also to um, uh, avoid uh, giving support to, uh, for example, exploitative uh, labor practices. So, you know, child labor or, or, or whatever. Um, so uh, a lot of this is driven um, by, um, 
um, the private sector. So in other words, by consumer demand and then by the large uh, retailers and, and traders reflecting that in terms of uh, you know the conditions that they would impose on their uh, on their suppliers in uh, third uh, third countries and i think uh, i think we will see that growing and um, uh, and we may indeed also see it being regulated more so for example there are proposals uh, before the um, european parliament at the moment um, you know that would require uh, uh, supply chain actors uh, to to exercise due diligence uh, in their supply chain. So it wouldn't any longer just be a voluntary thing that uh, you might do for for corporate social responsibility, but it would be a legal obligation uh, to ensure that you know you are not uh, contributing to to deforestation or to uh, child labour. The other uh, aspect, which is also important and, and relates to specifically to what the questioner highlights, uh, the sort of farm to fork uh, strategy, um, because clearly uh, that is going to uh, raise uh, standards um, and raise costs indeed for uh, for European farmers. Um, uh, so there will be, um, you know, in 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 the in in the in the correct uh, attempt to to try to uh, reverse the decline in biodiversity, for example, um, we will be asking farmers to set aside, uh, you know, the, the proposal is up to ten percent of their uh, of their land for 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 nature, and that obviously that is land that will not be uh, used for 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 uh, for agriculture production, um, and uh, the, the farm to fork strategy also also uh, foresees um, uh, reductions in the uses of, of, of chemical inputs, both pesticides and, and chemical fertilizers, um, and then in, indeed also higher animal uh, welfare standards. So um, the, the, what, what European farmers would say to that then is that that's, that's fine. We, we, we are prepared to, to adjust uh, our, our practices to meet these standards, but then we don't think it's fair uh, that uh, imports can continue to enter the European market uh, from countries that uh, you know, are not uh, asking their farmers to, to, to meet these, uh, these requirements. Um, and uh, to return to the to the previous question on on Brexit, um, I mean this was very much uh, a contentious point in negotiating uh, the free trade agreement between uh, the European Union and uh, the United Kingdom. Um, what were called in, in in those discussions the level playing field uh, conditions. In other words, what. What, what actions could uh, either party take if, for example, uh, the other party uh, relaxed uh, environmental conditions in such a way that it gave, uh, uh, you know, what many would see as an unfair uh, competitive advantage uh, to farmers, and, and that might put European uh, farmers uh, at, a, at, at a disadvantage. And uh, indeed, in that trade agreement, for the very first time, uh, there are uh, quite um, uh, quite innovative. Uh, instruments uh, introduced whereby uh, it will be possible to introduce trade uh, sanctions, in other words, to withdraw some of the concessions uh, that have been made to the other party if uh, there is um, not just a perception, but if there is evidence uh, that um, uh, lower uh, uh, social or environmental or, or climate uh, standards uh, is causing material damage to the uh, industry, uh, the agricultural industry in the other party. So um, I would see uh, certainly the European Union making greater use of this in its free trade agreements, uh, where these will be bilaterally negotiated. Um, whether we will see these uh, extending into the multilateral arena, um, uh, you'll be aware that um, uh, the European Union is proposing what's called a border carbon uh, adjustment measure to try to offset uh, the additional costs of, of, of carbon taxes, uh, which will not, in the at least in the initial stages, it will not apply to food. Um, it, it will really apply to a rather narrow range of, of heavy industries like steel and cement, uh, I think, but you can see the direction that uh, that is is going. And of course, for for countries that are exporting to the EU or or, or would like to export, uh, potentially like India, um, you know, being aware of these trends and trying to uh, react and and to prepare for them is 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 clearly going to be uh, an an important element in future policy. Yep. 
Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, about sort of six minutes left. I'm, or maybe we can extend it to a couple more since we began a bit late. But I'm just going to invite the two discussants, Eileen and Shubhartha, to come in um, if they want to uh, make any further comments and also to throw out two questions to you as well, the discussants. One uh, which has been posed directly to Professor Mitra from uh, one of our colleagues, Vidushi. Um, slightly, uh, you know, the, slightly provocative now, the two questions. Why is the extension of international solidarity to protesting farmers viewed with a lens of skepticism? And someone had also mentioned before that uh, celebrities and external actors have chipped in on previous uh, issues as well. So why, why are we extra sensitive on this particular topic? And to Eileen, just noticing your uh, comments in the chat. Uh, so Brexit is definitely not the way forward. Right. It's, I mean, what are your views on that? I mean, this idea of taking back autonomy, does that give you more scope to introduce then and, and get through the reforms that you actually want? Um, just I, I'd like to hear your views on that. And then um, we'll have one last round for the speakers to make any concluding remarks and we'll close then. So thank you very much to uh, Professor Subarto. I think you're not yet on audio. OK. Um, why is dialogue so difficult in India? The government has offered 11 rounds. The Supreme Court has set up a committee of specialists. Why are farmers not dialoguing? Here, one has to look very carefully at who the farmers are. They do not represent the whole broad range of the farming community for one thing. For another thing, the, at this point actually has been made by Rudolf and Rudolf. And there is a, this problem of militancy where anyone who gets into a dialogue would be cast aside by more militant groups. So there isn't one cohesive voice of the farmers and the internal rivalry of the various farming organizations makes a current sustained dialogue very, very difficult. The second problem with regard to the political parties is the whole strength of the NDA, the governing coalition, is crushing. The opposition finds it, therefore, very difficult to come up with an alternative policy. Democracies, like in the UK, for example, the government has a policy on COVID, so does the opposition, and one can then have a dialogue between the two. That is not happening. Now, these are things that are germane to the Indian political system and what I have described elsewhere as India's middle democracy trap. And that is not known. And this is why there's a lot of misinformation. The second point here that should be made also is uh, the opposition to the Farm Act is actually riding on a much bigger opposition to the Modi government by the states which are under the opposition parties and a section of Indian media, which is also against those other policies. The two are not disaggregated as a result of which it's all in all going in the wash, so to say, and no uh, rational debate is possible between the economics of farming and the politics of farming. And I have also asked a specific question as to why can't Indian products find their way to the global market where they are cash crop, they could bring in a lot of money to supplement farm income. I am very grateful to Prof Suda for giving me a good answer as to how those products could be introduced. I mean, I have some experience of the introduction of cashew nuts in Odisha, and now I find big, small, medium cashew farmers coming up and cashew processing companies acting a bit like the putting out system in the UK at the time of industrialization. So those things are happening. The global audience does not know. So their reaction is a bit like the Pavlov's dog. The moment it is India and farmer, they think of the crushing of farmers by capital in Europe at the time of European industrialization. Anyway, 
I'm very grateful that we had a chance to get into these nitty gritty facts of Indian politics and India's political economy. And Jeeva, thank you for making the point that we have to bring together the moral economy of farming and the political economy of farming. This is why conversations like this are so very useful and thank you. Thank you so much. Eileen, over to you. Um, you asked about um, Brexit and you said, um, will this greater freedom be improve agricultural policy? And my short answer is no. And I'm saying no because it isn't an issue of just a government's freedom to act. It's what that government wants to do with this freedom. Um, the UK has had a long time since the 19th century attachment to a cheap food policy. And a cheap food policy does not encourage um, a good agricultural sector or a focus on an agricultural sector or a focus on the welfare of land or the welfare of farmers. And so I think all the evidence is that the current government of the UK will not um, improve, use, take the opportunity to improve farming or have a really strong focus on good quality food production in the UK it, because its interests are elsewhere and it is, it would be more interested in importing cheap food than producing food. Um, I think that's, yeah, because, and the other point I wanted to make, which goes across both India and um, the European Union, is agricultural policy isn't a series of technical fixes. Um, and I think um, Professor Suda's made this point. It's very complex and it depends on the political goals of the government. And maybe one of the goals of the current Indian government is greater centralization. And if one of its goals is greater centralization and the bolstering of um, big Indian business interests, then it's doing that at the sacrifice of other layers of the um, agricultural system. Um, and I can see, um, Professor Mitra's point about the nature of political opposition. But I do think farming protests in India have a long and complex history that just goes be, you know, is much deeper than this present particular conflict. And then the only other thing I want to say is uh, really thanks to both speakers because it really was an education for me. Thanks. And very interesting. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I would just ask if the two speakers wanted to say a final word of, uh, you know, after, after hearing all the discussions, perhaps you've read some of the chatter. It's also provoked a lot of uh, opinions from our colleagues. Um, and it is an issue that, that I think evokes a lot of strong um, emotions and opinions uh, entirely justified. And maybe you just had some final closing remarks before I then bring this session to a close. Uh, yeah. I. Thank you very much for having me here. It's been uh, really uh, engaging. Uh, I just, uh, I, I, my own sense is that the farmers are seeing things, uh, they, they, they're perceiving and anticipating consequences of this reform that maybe commentators are unable to see. And uh, because the Punjab farmers who are leading the struggle actually have been the innovators for a long time. The first agribusinesses came there, the contract farming schemes that first came to India happened there, and their experience has been underwhelming. So uh, I think uh, I, I wouldn't put it all down to politics and uh, uh, vested interests. I think, uh, and, and in fact, uh, that, that's been my stance saying it's time economists stop talking and heard out the farmers uh, because clearly they are seeing something that we haven't. And one of the things that's uh, stood out is the incredible unity of the farmers. So I agree with Professor Mitra that there's a complete loss of trust, but I don't believe that uh, they are not unified and there, are, uh, there is a lot of discord amongst them. I think that stood out uh, and surprised many of us. Um, but uh, we can take this conversation outside. But thank you very much for this opportunity. And I've really, it's been a privilege to share the platform with all of you. Thank you very much. 
uh, I think that was an excellent uh, conclusion, uh, Yuvanda. So uh, to be honest, I don't really have anything additional to add. I, I really think the questions uh, were absolutely the right ones uh, to ask. Uh, and I was really uh, interested to, to learn more about uh, the background to the farmer protests in, in, in India. Um, you know, it's clear that uh, change of any kind is difficult. Um, and how to bring about change is something we really need to, to, to focus uh, our minds on because, uh, you know, in Europe, uh, with respect to the, to the climate transition, uh, you know, there is a lot of emphasis on, on it being a just transition and what exactly that means. Um, but, you know, the same kind of issues uh, arise even uh, looking at, uh, at issues around agricultural uh, policy. And um, it's clear that change you know, there are going to be uh, uh, losers. There are going to be people who are, who, who, who are not able to, uh, to, to, to make the adjustments. Um, and, and clearly they have the, the, the right to protest and, and uh, the right to, in a sense, uh, uh, make their voices heard. Uh, so, you know, but how to manage that uh, in, in a way that um, uh, allows us to address, uh, you know, what are, what are really urgent challenges. We do need change. Uh, and I'm speaking here now more from the European perspective. Uh, uh, we do need change in agricultural policy. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, I think it's been a really interesting discussion uh, and, and something to think about, about how we actually uh, bring that change uh, about, uh, given, you know, that it, it inevitably uh, uh, has different, there are different interests at stake. So again, thank you for organizing the session and uh, it was really worthwhile. Thank you so much. I think it, it just uh, remains for me to thank everyone again. I, I think it has been extremely informative and a lot of information to process. Me as moderating, it was quite, uh, you know, I got a lot of, I was trying to keep track of both India and Europe uh, information, which, as we said, it, it, we're looking at this in parallel, but there's so many angles which can provide food for thought of looking at this more in depth from not a standard comparative study, but you know, both India and Europe do not exist in a vacuum. So we really need to see these two entities in the global picture. And I think we can really follow up on today's session and, and develop some interesting ideas to take forward. So thank you very much to our speakers and to our discussants, to our audience for joining us from different time zones and for your questions. And I also want to end by thanking Dr. Hari, who is uh, with us at DCU. Uh, Ms. Kusumika Ghosh and Mr. Nikhil Dasari, who were all very, uh, you know, played very important roles in getting this event together. And um, I'm very thankful to everyone's support and hope you'll join us for future events uh, that will be hosted by the Institute. So if I may ask everyone to join me in maybe turning on your speakers or just giving a virtual clap to our speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. It was Bye. lovely to see you. Have Bye.